Okay, thank you. So the title of my talk then is, is Building Bridges, which may seem an odd thing to be talking about at a festival of maintenance, but hopefully by the end of it, you'll see that um, how we build bridges is a significant part of, of how we uh, enter into their maintenance and, and um, keep on top of it. At universities, we advertise our civil engineering courses with big fancy pictures of bridges on the front of them, uh, the prospectuses, and the students come in and think they're going to be designing bridges straight from day one. But as um, I'm sure most people in the room are aware, the, the, most of the infrastructure, particularly in developed countries, is, is in place. And most of those young engineers, the next generation of engineers, if you like, their role is going to be... Um, maintaining the existing structure. Okay, um, so I want to talk about the fact that, that although um, maintaining structures that exist is something that we try and um, move our students into thinking is going to be their role in their careers, there is a, a role for thinking about how we uh, design bridges in the first place. Um, so I'm going to have a look at a case study, if you like, that's close to home, very close to home. Many of you may have struggled to get here with the traffic. Uh, that is Churchill Way flyover uh, down by the Birkenhead Tunnel. And if you came here by road, you invariably uh, or undoubtedly got um, clogged up in the traffic there or have got tied up in the traffic over the last few weeks. That is a structure that was um, designed and built in the 1960s. And it uses a technique uh, which was quite common in the 1960s called post-tensioning, reinforced concrete, post-tensioned concrete. And that's um, been significant in the news lately. Uh, the Genoa Bridge was a post-tension structure that collapsed. Um, there are several structures that have collapsed with less um, newsworthy note, but uh, they, they, they are a problematic form of construction. Okay? Bridges, we design them to codes of practice, and those codes of practice require the durability of those structures to ensure that they have a life of, uh, in the UK, typically 120 years. So that is the design life that we use for designing bridges. That bridge has lasted 50 years, and it's got to the point where it um, not only is in need of um, significant repair, it's actually beyond repair. Okay? And so I want to talk about what we can learn from that type of construction and how it came about and, and why it is that we need to, or, and indeed have moved away from those types of construction and how we can think about how we build structures, build bridges with uh, maintenance in mind and durability in mind. Okay? So just a few photos of, of that structure. That structure is now being demolished, and it's been demolished because it has got to the point where it uh, essentially can't be trusted, and we'll talk about what that means. It can't be trusted to take its uh, own weight even and, and the weight of the traffic that it was designed for. Now, that sounds very dramatic, and we'll come on to look at why um, it's perhaps less scary than it might first seem if someone says the bridge can't theoretically take its own weight. Uh, we'll talk about how engineers determine that and, and what we need to do to be able to improve on that situation. So currently that uh, is being cut up and taken down and demolished. Um, so you'll see sections of the bridge there. Uh, this, this section here used to be in here, so that, that was connected up to there, and it's been cut with a big diamond saw, diamond band saw, uh, cut through the concrete, and then lifted out on this fairly fancy temporary works structure, which is quite a structure in its own right, and transported and down into this holding area where it will be broken up. Um, crushed, and that crushed concrete will then go to be used in, um, as aggregate for future structures. So there is some saving grace to the fact that uh, a 50-year-old bridge needs to be demolished in the sense that the, the material will be recycled to some extent. So the way that engineers design bridges, or all design from an engineering perspective, is really about managing risk. Um, so 
this has reached a point where the risk of it staying in place is too high. Okay, so, so, or if you like to think of it another way, um, the risk of it collapsing is, is unacceptably high. Okay, so, and, and that's been um, influenced by recent developments. The Genoa Bridge certainly made us rethink about the probabilistic models that we use for looking at these bridges. And it was decided that, that those probabilistic models say that this is something that we can't leave in place. Um, so down it comes. And that's quite common of several structures. That's another structure out towards Manchester, a post-tensioned structure, reinforced concrete, uh, but a specific type of reinforced concrete structure, post-tensioned post structure um, that, that's needed to be demolished. And there are several bridges in a similar situation from the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s, when this technique was developed and used quite extensively on the British motorway expansion. Uh, essentially, that's, that's what gave rise to it. It's a very quick form of construction, um, and it's, it actually gives rise to very slender architectural structures that the uh, aspect ratios or the span to depth ratios of that is a, a very slender design, and that, that was an aesthetic requirement. And that's capable because of the form of construction, which is a very strong form of construction, up to a point. So... Probabilistic models are what we look at. I, I did have a set of um, uh, probabilistic slides. They were very maths heavy, and, and I was told that maybe I should uh, just change that. So I've, I've redrawn them by hand. So apologies for the hand drawings, but it's, believe me, it's a lot easier to follow than. It's the same curve, but the, I've took, taken all the equations off it. So. Um, that, that's just for those of you who aren't aware of a, a normal distribution, that might be a distribution of the height of people in the room. So in this room, we'll have a series of different heights of people, and they will occur a number of times. Okay, so in, this is a, a primary school class, and you might expect people to be around this area. So most of the people, the frequency of occurrence will occur with this sort of height. And if you happen to have a very tall teacher in your classroom, then, then you might get up to that end. But the, the frequency of occurrence of that, either this end or that end of the scale, are, are much lower than, if you like, the average or the mean or the median or the mode for, for the statisticians. Okay? So we look at probabilistic analyses, uh, probabilistic distributions. So that's one distribution. Um, that's another distribution for university classes where people have grown up a bit in height. Uh, and that tends to then get more skewed. So that's gone away from a, what we call a normal distribution to a, a skewed distribution. Um, but the significant thing is, is that most of the people in a particular room, in all the rooms, in all the universities, in all the world, will have a tendency for people to be in this sort of range here. Okay, So that's what we do initially to look at probabilistic analysis of uh, bridge de Ford bridge design. And we look at things such as the loads that a bridge will experience in its life, and that will be the distribution of the loads, the traffic loads. So most days, the traffic loading will be somewhere here. Some days, there'll be light traffic, and that'll be here, and, and some days, you'll get a very heavy load going over. But for most of the time, you'll end up with this Q bar, which is, if you like, an average um, value for the loading on the, on the bridge structure. And similarly, we'll build up a model for the strength of that structure, or the resistance, which is R bar. And that's a more predictable thing, because we know what the materials are, we know the size of them, we know the strengths of the materials, so that's a much narrower band. Okay? So we can expect that distribution to have some variability, but, but more concentrated about a, a set value. And um, what we then do is we compare those two distributions and we see that from the vast majority of the time, the loadings that we apply to a bridge will be much less than their strength. Okay, So that's how we uh, determine how strong a bridge is from a probabilistic, stochastic um, probability spectrum point of view. But you can see that there is this area in here, which is actually quite a rarity. So if you had a, 
bridge that had some defect in it that meant that its resistance was lower than the average, much lower than the average. You could get it in here, and then uh, we could get a load that comes across the bridge, which is much greater than the average, and then suddenly you're in a territory where things are a little bit um, um, potentially problematic. Okay, so that, that's that area within that curve there. But it's not reasonable to, to design structures that are super strong, if you like, such that that area is, is zero. So what we do is we come to some assessment of what is deemed to be an acceptable risk. Okay? And the way we do that is we look at things called characteristic values. Again, for the statisticians, you'll, you'll probably know what that means. But essentially what we do is we say, what is the worst credible strength that this structure can have? And we'll have a cut off at this point, some point here, and say that it's not really credible that we'll get a strength of a bridge that's less than this value here. So in all the bridges in all the world, properly maintained, they'll probably have some strength that is greater than this value here. And with all the um, traffic regulations, for example, all the vehicles that are on the road, properly maintained vehicles, not overloaded vehicles, the, the loading spectrum is not going to exceed that in, in terms of what we deem to be an acceptable risk. There's always a risk that you will get something exceeding that, and there's always a risk that something will happen to your bridge, which means it's not as strong as you might think it, it is um, characteristically. But as long as we all agree, and the codes of practice that engineers use agree on what those values should be, uh, based on probabilistic studies, uh, we can say... As long as the strength, the characteristic strength, if you like, with various factors applied to it, is greater than the characteristic load that we put on it, then that's acceptable to keep that in service. Okay? And that's how we design structures. Design of structures is really about risk analysis, risk modeling. Okay? So if we now move to um, that, that's the section through Churchill Way. And the problem that we have is, is, is these things here. And what those things are are steel tendons, and those steel tendons are under a great deal of tension. And they were put in the bridge in ducts. So you can, you can just about see them here, but you can see them quite clearly here. Within that duct, there are several tendons, and those tendons were then grouted in after they'd been put under a lot of post-tensioning. Post-tensioning is tensioning applied after the structure has been cast in situ. Okay, And the problem with that is, is that they're hidden from view. And if you can see in the top deck of, of the structure there, there's a lot of cracks in that top deck. That's the road above it. So over the years, water percolates down through the cracks and gets into these ducts, and it starts to corrode those tendons. And those tendons start to break. Um, and when they start to break, then the ability of that bridge to hold itself up uh, deteriorates quite rapidly. Okay? But the problem that we've got is, is that it's very difficult to know what state they're in. Okay? You can't really inspect them. You can just about get in here, although I don't recommend it. It's not very nice in there. But even if you can get in here, you can't really see what's going on in those tendons. Okay? The only way to see that is to uh, do some uh, what's called destructive testing. And we, we like non-destructive testing as engineers, obviously. But you have to break a bit of the bridge to get to see the tendons. So you're actually doing damage to try and inspect it. So you can't do too much of that. So the probabilistic model that you then have for that structure's strength rapidly gets to a point where it's, it's quite markedly different to the one we looked at before. So we've got the same loading profile. For a primary distributor road in Liverpool, we can tell what, roughly what vehicles are going to be using it. But the range of strengths, the range of resistances, is, is much more spread out. Okay? And what that means is, is that where we take the characteristic value for that resistance, we end up with something. So the characteristic strength might be the 95th percentile, so we might have 5% of the area or the integral of the curve, the area under the curve in here, and 95%. So 95% of the time, it's stronger than this characteristic value here. Okay. The problem we have with that is if we now apply that to the loading model that we've got, 
the loading model is in a significant number of times greater than the assessed potential worst credible strength. Okay? So we then have to make the decision, can we keep that structure in service? Okay, so we have to accept that these codes of practice are the codes of practice that define what is an acceptable risk. There's a lot of discussions in a lot of heated arguments about whether we should keep it going or not. But ultimately, um, particularly after Genoa, when, when you get a, a structure of a similar type with post-tensioned steel tendons in ducts, grouted ducts, you have to come to the conclusion that it's, it's not safe to keep that in service. Now, if you notice, the average strength from the calculations is actually quite high. This, if you see this arrow here, the black arrow, was the arrow for a more precisely defined resistance. So in actual fact, on average, this structure is probabilistically like to be stronger, but it's less reliable. Okay? So we then have a situation where the likelihood is, is that the Churchill Way flyover is, is strong enough to take a lot bigger loads than we have to say we can rely on. Okay, that gets very complicated to, to get that concept. So why is it then that, that uh, um, other concrete structures are deemed to be more acceptable? Does anybody know what that building is? Liver building, that's the one, yeah. So that's down on the, by, by the Mersey. Reinforced concrete was brought in to the UK um, by two French engineers. Hennebeek developed the technique in France. Louis-Gustave Michel brought the uh, technique across uh, to the UK. And the Liver building was one of the first reinforced concrete framed structures. Uh, there are a lot of bridges, Hennebeek, system Hennebeek bridges. That's a system Hennebeek bridge. Um, that, that were built the turn of the last century, um, just before in the, the First World War. So they've lasted a lot longer. Okay? But the difference is, is they, they have this ferro-concrete or reinforced concrete, where you have concrete that's reinforced by steel bars. Those steel bars aren't under tension in the same way that the 1960s technique was developed for... Um, the Churchill Way flyover or, or other post-tension structures. And the thing with that is, is that when it starts to deteriorate, it, it undergoes what's called a ductile failure rather than a brittle failure. And ductile failures let you know they're happening a long time before they get to the point of collapse, whereas brittle failures just suddenly go. Okay? So that's built into the probabilistic model that we use to assess bridges such as the... Um, Churchill Way flyover. The, the, the risk factors that develop that model are based on the fact that um, the post-tension structures fail without any warning suddenly, what we call a catastrophic failure. And it's catastrophic in, in every sense of the word. The engineering word catastrophic, or the engineering word use of catastrophic failure is just one that happens suddenly and is irreversible. Okay? So there are Concrete structures, which are much older than the Churchill Way flyover, but they're more reliable because they use uh, a different technique. And when they start to fail, you see cracks, and those cracks um, alert you to the fact that there's a problem a long time before the problem gets out of hand, whereas you just don't get that warning with post-tension structures. So how then do we as engineers learn from those and develop the ways for uh, designing new structures. Um, just very quickly, I won't go into too much detail, but, but that, that's a, um, a finite element model which illustrates uh, pre-stressing or post-tensioning. Pre-stressing can take two forms, pre-tensioning and post-tensioning. We'll look at pre-tensioning in a minute. Uh, post-tensioning is what was used on, on Churchill Way flyover. If you want a, an example of a pretensioned element of a structure, most people are familiar with a bicycle wheel. These spokes are very weak in compression. If you take a spoke and compress it, it will just buckle with very little load at all. Very strong in tension. Okay? So this hub is transferring a load down to the ground through this 
spoke. And on the face of it, it looks like that spoke would never be able to take a person's weight, and indeed it wouldn't. But if you pre-stress it, so if you tension it so high that when you sit the person on the hub and, and, and apply the force downwards, that force is only reducing the tension rather than putting it into compression. So the thing's still in tension, so the structure still works. So that's the, the concept of why we pre-stress things. And that's the pre-stressing that was used in the Churchill way. And these are the tendons that we use. They're, those are the anchor blocks. Uh, these are the cables that are in this anchor block for the next section. We tension them up and tie them off, and that puts a lot of compression into the concrete. Concrete is very good in compression, and it's very weak in, in tension. So basically, all that pre-stressing keeps the concrete in compression and stops it ever going into tension, or at least that's the, the theory. Okay, so that's why we do it. But now we've moved, since knowing about uh, the problems with post-tensioning, we've still used pre-stressing, but we use a pre-tensioned uh, form of it. When I started designing bridges in the 1980s, the, there was a moratorium on, on pre-stressed bridges, post-tensioning altogether. Um, and then we started to look at... Um, Pre-casting these beams, so they're cast in a, a factory environment rather than in situ, as the, the um, Churchill Way flyover was cast. So there's a lot more control over that in the, in the factory situation. So we've got ways of, of controlling the way that we manufacture it. And we've got a lot more predictability about the, the statistics of its strength from that. Also, we um, pre-tension it so pre-stresses we've talked about, but instead of post-tensioning it, we tension up the wires in a big anchor block, and then we cast the concrete around that. And that's a much more efficient way of protecting those tendons. So we can make sure that the, the tendons are grouted in properly. It's in a factory environment. It's in a controlled environment. So we've got a lot more predictability for that type of um, form of construction. And... We're now using that form of construction to, to go back. The moratorium has been lifted and post-tension structures are now permitted, except that we don't have post-tensioning that, or we tend not to have post-tension that is in ducts, like on the Churchill Way viaduct, and we also tend to have the sections already precast, so they're, they're precast in a yard in a, a factory environment which has a lot more control over it. So these tendons now... If you, you can get into this space and you can actually see the tendons and you can see the tendons beyond those anchor points there and inspect them on a regular basis, whereas you couldn't really do that on the Churchill Way. So from a maintenance point of view, we've got much more predictability about that uh, strength model that we had. That's a, a post-tensioning jack. That, that you, that's, so that's the hydraulic jack that's used to, to jack the tendons up and then they're locked off in an anchor uh, and that then puts the, this concrete here into large amounts of compression. What we can also do is put sensors into the tendons, and we can tell when the sensors are starting to lose their um, preload. And we can also put, uh, and we've tried to do this um, post-construction on, on structures such as the Churchill Way and put acoustic monitors on. You can actually hear the, the tendons when they break. They have a very precise... Uh, acoustic signature um, and you can do some very fancy things about predicting where that break is but again you have to apply some kind of risk because you don't know where you're starting from when you start the acoustic monitoring so if you put all that monitoring in, in, in the start then you can keep a, abreast of what's going on throughout the whole life of the structure uh, understanding how materials such as pre-stressing tendons and concrete work in this situation. This is a test rig in a university laboratory. These are the tendons that are being jacked up to tension. Um, and then that's a, a load that's applied and various testing is done. And those testing uh, experiments, the, the data from that testing, then feeds into the more refined strength models so that we can narrow that uh, normal distribution of strengths and make it more predictable, and then uh, understand more about what the risk is associated with that structure. Oops, sorry. And as I said, 
pre-casting so that, that instead of casting the concrete in situ, which is subject to the weather, subject to uh, the workforce that you get on site in the 1960s, there was a huge explosion in bridges being built throughout the UK. Um, and the workforce often weren't skilled concrete placing um, operatives. So this is a much more controlled environment and therefore a much more predictable environment. So that's a section through uh, the Churchill Way viaduct. Cast in situ, these tendons are in a place where you can't get to, to, to inspect them. Um, and that the once uh, time has passed up to a certain point, you don't know where you're starting from, even if you can get sensors on to, to check it. This is a modern form of post-tension construction. Concrete's being precast. The tendons are exposed so that you can see them and crawl through the bridge or walk through the bridge. Some of these bridges are big enough to walk through uh, and inspect the tendons. Other ways that we have developed um, really are about managing the data that's associated with infrastructure. So we have techniques now, which uh, something called BIM, which is building information model. And we uh, start from the very beginning of putting all the information into a model, and that model gets passed on to all the stakeholders and ultimately ends up in the hands of the uh, maintenance uh, organization, whether that's the local authority or, or contracted out. So they have the full data from pre-design, uh, pre-concept design, right the way through to construction, Anything that happened on site in terms of placing concrete changes to specifications gets recorded in one model and that model gets passed on. So that's a, a big part of modern development for, for controlling. Again, just, just risk management, really. Analytical tools, instead of um, very s simple hand calculations, computer technology can, can analyze the stresses and the strengths within a structure much better. We've talked about materials, they've improved, we understand them better. We've talked about the manufacturer, the control that we have on the manufacturer process. And precasting is a big uh, factor in this type of construction. If you can get the concrete built before you take it out to site in a controlled environment, that makes a big difference. So reliable infrastructure is uh, moving on in, in big steps from the design point of view, from the, at the design stage. But we also need to, to look at the maintenance of the existing infrastructure and how that's changing. So this is how we used to inspect bridges when I was doing it uh, in the 90s, I suppose, 80s, 90s. Um, we you know, take our lives into our hands and, and go out on that, which is not a very nice thing. I'll tell you if it's howling a gale and it's in the middle of winter. Um, so it's very difficult, dangerous, and expensive to invest, investigate bridges, inspect bridges in those kind of situations. Modern technology has allowed us to develop ways of drone inspections, and that's the drones that most of you are familiar with, but specialist drones which are designed to run up and down particular elements of a structure uh, and, and record details of what's going on. And pick up data from embedded systems that are actually in the structure themselves. Okay, so that's a, a big development in recent years. So bridges are now connected. Uh, they even talk to d databases uh, that bridge managers have. They can actually monitor them in real time in some situations on the newer bridges. Um, and the Internet of Things will probably mean that the whole infrastructure will become a, a smart infrastructure. Okay, that's... Uh, that's me done. Thank you very much.